Disruption Channel Podcast. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode on the Conception Channel Podcast. I'm your host, Spence Pentland, and today we have a very special guest. Welcome to the show, Kara Kalen. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. Yeah, uh, it's awesome. I, I'm happy that you wanted to jump in and and obviously passionate about what you do and uh, EMDR in particular. But we'll and we'll get to that because I want to learn more, and I'm sure other people do. But uh, this is uh, you're and you're Kara's a registered cl- clinical counselor here in in British Columbia with. You know, a background in EMDR and 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 some sports and business too, and which is which is interesting. You can maybe touch on that. I'll hand over the mic soon for you to uh, uh, give people a little bit of a background on you. But but for the most part, today is uh, about anyone. Our, our show is usually focused on fertility, like I said earlier, and uh, but with anyone experiencing perinatal loss, postpartum depression, miscarriages or terminations, or even uh, birth traumas, which is very interesting. Uh, this show it applies to that and, and is for you. So, so keep listening if that, uh, um, if that is you, but Kara, do you want to give everyone a bit of a, a bit of your story so they can connect and know um, who you are and, and where you're coming from? Sure, I'd love to. Awesome. Um, I I spent uh, three decades in the sport world. So I started my life as a national stream synchronized swimmer and oh, wow. later wore various hats, including coaching with Team BC and Team Canada. Um, and then later, you know, various uh, positions in the sport organizations. And at my peak, I was working with athletes, you know, for over 40 hours a week, traveling extensively across Canada, internationally, and while also working in private practice as a clinical counselor. Mm -hmm. And I watched many athletes and clients thrive and get stuck in the same, what, you know, I kind of refer to now as same kind of loops. And I always felt, you know, there was something missing. I didn't exactly know what it was. It was just the sense that I had in me. And because I was, you know, really committed to developing, you know, in in the sport world, just like the whole person, I was really committed to that. It wasn't my experience as an athlete. And so, you know, I eventually enrolled in EMDR training and it was in that training where I was actually taken back to an 11 year old sport trauma that I had experienced when I was young. And it was through that process that I saw how for me, a seed of not good enough was planted. Right. And how I then spent the next two decades of my life trying to prove worthiness, um, really to everyone around me. And it was very confronting. And, you know, really was the catalyst for my own healing journey. And what I started to discover was how the seeds of trauma, um, how they had been planted. And then, you know, what I wanted to know more and and what I started to do was just really understand the impact that they had had in my life. And once I, you know, started to uncover all of that, then I got really curious about how I was going to bring that into my clinical space. So I really remember sitting in my backyard when that EMDR training um, concluded And I just had this deep sense of like, this is it. Like, this is the missing part. Okay. What is EMDR? That sounds great. That's amazing. Okay. Can you, can you tell us all like what EMDR is? Yeah. So I guess one thing I actually forgot to tell in that whole story, which is, you know, kind of what brings me to the birthing space before I go into EMDR is that I'm also a mother of four. Okay. So I have two um, children, uh, who two boys that are eight and six, and then I have twin daughters that are three. And okay. so that that is an important part of, of this story as well. And we'll kind of get there later. But awesome. uh, EMDR stands for eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. Okay. So it's an extensively researched and effective psychotherapy. And it's been proven to help people recover from trauma, and PTSD symptoms. Okay. 
So what the research shows us is that EMDR is helpful in treating disorders such as anxiety, depression, OCD, chronic pain, addictions, and really other distressing life experiences. And in the, in the trauma world, most people will be familiar with uh, Bessel van der Kolk. And he writes about how EMDR therapy has been superior to even Prozac in trauma treatment. And, you know, it's, it's really um, a, a modality that has been shared from like over 7 million people have been successfully treated with EMDR in over 130 countries. So that's a really incredible, you know, piece of this um, yeah. puzzle. Yeah, there is, there's good evidence. Okay. So I've movement desensitization and re sensitize no reprocessing you got it yeah okay you got yeah. it um so somehow this obviously the, the work that's done has something to do with with eye movement like call it calling a spade a spade here <laughs> um can can and i know you do groups and 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 individual and stuff all kinds of things but um how does how does it differ than like a normal maybe in contrast to a normal one-on-one -on -one, uh, session with with a uh, with a counselor, because you're a registered clinical counselor, so is it? Can you kind of just give a a snapshot of what what a treatment looks like? And yeah, months? yeah. So I think one of the things that's important to know is that when we you know experience any kind of trauma or stressful event that that really gets, you know, we, how I kind of say it in the most simplest way is it kind of gets stuck in the right hemisphere of the brain. So mm. our brains do have a natural way to recover from, you know, different traumatic memories, but the process of EMDR really involves, you know, communication between the amygdala, which is the alarm signal for stressful events, um, right. the hippocampus, which is assist with learning you know, memories and really about safety and danger. And then the prefrontal cortex, which analyzes and controls behavior and emotion. And so while many times traumatic experiences, you know, can be managed, um, they, they may not be processed without help. And so one of the things that we do in a one-to-one -one session is when clients come to me, we will often try and understand what is the full history of, you know, somebody's life. So there's, you know, some paperwork that we have people fill out before they come. And oftentimes clients come with a real desire to understand, you know, um, the certain triggers that are showing up in their life, or they're interested in, um, you know, learning more about how they can, you know, uh, just show up differently, you know, with it, whether it's in triggering situations or with people that they love or in the workplace. Um, and so we will spend some time really understanding that looking at attachment, you know, early childhood attachment, which is really a key part of it. And, and then kind of finding like, what is what are the things that are tripping me up right now in your life, and then we kind of move backwards. Okay, and so when we actually get into the EMDR reprocessing, we don't actually need to talk about the traumatic moment with the client. You know, we, we don't, we, in, in EMDR, we don't want to know that because what we do know is that when we talk about traumatic memories, we can actually reflood the nervous system and we have the potential to re-traumatize somebody. And oh, so that's right. why we don't want to, to, to get into details with people mm. about that. It's, I think that's a really important thing to know. That is, um, that would have, yeah, a hundred percent because, that may be the barrier to half 75%, who knows people not wanting to come a hundred percent. So that yeah. is typically the block, you know, when, when I started to kind of come out into the world, especially in different spaces and say like, I'm here to help reprocess trauma. Lots of times people go, Ooh, well, number one, I haven't experienced trauma, you know, my life's been pretty good. So that's not me or two. Well, my trauma is not as bad as that person's trauma. Mm -hmm. Or three, there's right. this whole group of people that think, man, if she starts talking to me, I'm going to totally be sidelined and I'm not going to be able to get out of bed. So like, forget about it. <laughs> I don't want right. to talk to her about it. Right. And so that's important, you know, because as we, as we start to unpack it, it, it's as simple as a headline. You know, we just say a headline. So 
It might be that at five years old, you fell off your bike and broke your arm. There might have been something traumatic in that experience, you know, the hospital visit or the car ride there or whatever, but we don't need to know that. And so we just use headlines for the different events, you know? So if we're talking about sort of being in this space where we're talking about the birthing journey, right? Right. We don't need to know all of the times that, you know, yeah, we don't need to know the story of it. Okay. Okay. You just need to know kind of this happened. Yeah. So just hold that. Okay. And so one of the things is that when we experience those traumatic events, what will happen is we will have these internalized belief systems. We call them negative cognitions. They get attached to the experience or the event. Okay. Okay. So in my case, in the example I gave earlier, it was like, when I experienced that trauma as an 11 year old, I believed that I wasn't good enough. There was a negative cognition that was attached to that. And so that seed for me got planted. Now, every time what happens with the brain is that every time that seed gets touched, the brain starts to build new channels of association to that one thing. Mm -hmm. So now we have layering that happens. So you get, can I, can I, in other words, (laughs) in other words, you get practice and, and actually get better at accessing that not good enough. Yes. That's crazy. Okay. Got it. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. So then, so then that's the thing. So, you know, in, in one-to-one sessions, what happens is we identify, we go, okay, what is the event that happened you give me a headline what's the negative belief that you feel when you think about that memory Mm -hmm. and then how intense does that feel in your body from zero to ten right because Mm -hmm. we know that our body stores trauma and so you know it's it's very rare that i have someone that shows up that they can't tell me right away where that lives you know as soon as they close their eyes and see it And they can, and they can think about the negative cognition almost immediately. You can connect it into the body. Like where it's in my chest or exactly here. Okay. Okay. My jaw, my ear, whatever. Yeah. And so then what happens is we use eye movement. So either, you know, when I work in a virtual practice, we use, I have a, a virtual program that I use and you can use the eye movement where your eyes move from left to right. Or we have an auditory one where you can listen and the beeping goes from right to left ear, or we do kinesthetic butterfly tapping. And that's where we tap right and left on our arms. And so what happens is we begin sort of, it's like, we like to use a a train metaphor. So much like when you come into a train station, you get on the, on the train, you take a seat. You know, you look out the window, you see the scenery there. And as you start to do the reprocessing, it's like the train leaves the station. And so you just start to observe and notice anything that kind of comes up. Now, this is the cool thing is that you don't need to know what's causing you to feel certain things. The brain knows, you know, and so sometimes people will come and they'll say, well, I don't have memories of my childhood, or I don't have memories or like, I don't remember what happened after that event. Like I just, and right. it's like, right. The, the brain is designed to keep us safe. That's the beauty of it. And awesome. so when we experience hard things, our brain actually goes, Oh, that's dangerous. Let's not go back to that memory. Let's dissociate from it. Let's focus on something different, go somewhere else. So it reroutes us. But the brain still has the wisdom that's still in there. So that's the beauty is that as we start to do the reprocessing, um, every single time we stop. So every reprocessing set, it, you know, on average lasts about 60 seconds and then we stop and then the client will share with me what came up, what they noticed. It might be, you know, body sensations. They might see visual things. They might have memories. They might be reminded of like possibly an earlier trauma that happened that they haven't thought about for decades it'll just pop up okay and so you just kind of move through the train you know you get on the train and you go through the journey together and you unpack that so that's the beautiful thing of of working one-to-one and you know often times you know especially working in the space of you know we're talking specifically about the birthing journey is that there's so many things that are involved in, in that process. And, you know, one of them is lots of times people, you know, women who undergo all the different 
things that are required to try and get pregnant. The truth is that they're showing up to the clinic already having experienced some trauma. Like we know that right? because it, you, you didn't get there without it. Right. You they're already... you're not knocking on your door. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That I wanted to touch on that because every, every month, is 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 trauma and and can i just spin back you said something mentioned something i i forget the one two and three but the one of them was basically com- comparative trauma impact and it and it's like oh my trauma you know of not getting pregnant again this cycle is isn't as worthy or something so it's it's buried or it's shoved aside or not recognized maybe and this is part of the trauma you know mm-hmm. I, I really, truly feel that the clients, you know, that I have sat with that have been through these journeys, even the, you know, the, the parenthood journeys is that there's always a sense of feeling isolated and alone with how they actually feel because mm. there might be people around them. There might be a whole, you know, friends around there that are, have experienced something different. And so instantly we're isolated. Instantly we feel alone, Right. Mm -hmm. And that just grows. So every time that happens, there's this feeling of being alone in it. And then there's also feeling of like, maybe our body is letting us down or it's failing us or it's not showing up the way we need it to, or maybe we're not trying hard enough. You know, maybe we need to do something more. And what happens is, you know, I'm not good enough. (laughs) Yeah, I'm not good enough. And, And then the people that we've entered the journey with, you know, maybe we have a partner in that that the the client's body is the one experiencing all of this. So then they feel isolated and detached from their partner, mm. right? So mm. there's another opportunity of, of feeling alone. Um, and then, you know, what I, as I, as I sat and thought about this today, it's like, then we have all of this thing. It's like a, it's like a snowball, right? We've rolled right. all these different experiences up. And then if it does happen, that a client, you know, is, uh, gets pregnant. Yeah. Lots of times the clients that I sit with have become, they're not even able to be fully present in no. the experience of being pregnant because of all the trauma that happened earlier. And then what gets layered on that is guilt and shame and all the other things that we feel because we are not able to connect with mm. our body and with our baby. And yeah. then that just continues to snowball after, right? So we're, it's like, think about, how we're, you know, these, you know, her people are being kind of set up for the whole process of even just entering, you know, parenthood, right? And then you have kids and you're like, man, if you didn't already realize that you had stuff you had to unpack, well, your kids are sure going to teach you that. Yeah, my goodness. It's true. Uh, Like it, what, what you're saying is, is so, so factual. And I, and I'm, and I'm so glad that you have such an intimate experience with 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 this client population and 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 um reproductive health and fertility in particular because yes there is that 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 trauma that you you spoke of and and that isolation um because it's not like it's cancer and and I can rally people behind me because I'm going through treatment and it, it's it's got a different energy to it as well and even within that is probably this shame and trauma because it's like well it's not big enough for me to to like announce to the world and and it's very private and i but it's huge to to these people the relative to to that diagnosis of cancer maybe to some you know yeah and what i would say in that most you know most situations is that whether it's 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 this journey, whether it's a cancer journey, whether it's a sport journey, it is really a people feel alone. And so that yeah. was what kind of, you okay. know, sparked my interest in groups. And so the difference between individual and mm-hmm. groups is that um, I actually got, I was contacted by a business right after COVID and, and really, cause this business was noticing, well, they wanted a different type of wellness program for their employees. Yeah. And their employees were what I would classify as experiencing vicarious trauma daily. Right. And so then I got curious and I was like, okay, how can I bring EMDR into a group space? Like, what would that look like? And, and so um, 
I, you know, started to look around and, and I, I found this amazing, uh, uh, a person, his name's Dr. Nacho a hero. Okay. And, uh, this this man has created like adapted the protocols to use in the group and really it came after um covid so he is basically the pioneer in the provision of the emdr therapy Mm -hmm. he has been deployed in over 200 worst case scenarios around the world and i mean he's received international awards but you can go online and google him he will go, you know, and he worked in the, in the United States when there's mass shootings, like he will go into, into gymnasiums with hundreds of people and treat them with this protocol. Oh, wow. So I thought that was fascinating. I was like, yeah, yeah, how is that happening? How, you know, so then I did all of his training and I started to implement this. And the cool thing about what he's done is that Unlike individual EMDR, where you have to share what happens in between each train station, the group protocol can you actually use art therapy. So now imagine you're in a space, you can offer reprocessing for people that maybe don't have that rapport, right? Because it takes time to build rapport and build connection with someone um, in order to be able to share some really deep hard stuff. But then I'm like, there's all these people that aren't even accessing me because they're afraid to do that. Yeah. So what would happen if we could show up into these spaces, bring a trauma informed type of therapy into the room and you're not required to tell me what you're noticing or what you're experiencing, but you are using your own, you know, paper and, and that process to just so it's like being in a yoga studio, you know, a silent participant kind of yeah, a yeah. silent mm-hmm. participant. And then, you know, it's like at the end, if people feel like they want to share, you know, there might be an invitation to at another time. You know what I mean? Because I've been in situations before, you know, especially being a counselor and, you know, people kind of ask if you want to share. And sometimes you kind of feel pressured that you have to, you don't have to. And I don't, I don't want to operate in that kind of way. I want people to feel like they're fully ready to share something if they want to. Public speaking is traumatic too. Yeah, right? (laughs) And and there's stories about that. There's stories Mm -hmm. about that. So, but, but I think what can be really healing is that if you get 10 people in a room with you who have experienced some sort of birthing trauma it doesn't have to be the same thing as you but you've got other people sitting in a room here what that does is it shows you like hey you're actually not alone in this you yeah. don't know everybody's story here but all you need to know is that it's been traumatic or stressful and that they're here gathering because they don't want to feel that way right and i think that there's power and healing in that you sure. know and so i think that there's there's another um another type of protocol that in a group space that you can actually use for prevention, you know, so it's not after the fact, but you can actually bring it into a group space before um, or immediately after. Right. So like if you had a, a monthly circle, well, I'm just throwing this out there. Yeah. Yeah. Please. That is exactly what I was thinking. You know, it's like you had a monthly circle where Every person who went to try and get pregnant and didn't, Had a they got pregnancy. to come mm-hmm. online mm-hmm. and we got to spend an hour together doing some reprocessing just about that month. Yeah. Like that loss didn't happen. Let's find the worst part of it. Find it in your body. Sit with it. Let's reprocess that in one hour. It's amazing what can happen. And so, huh. you know, I want to... Uh, I mean, obviously all the people that I work with is confidential, but in, in, in a, in a reprocessing session that I did with a client that was pretty, pretty soon after a loss, um, I would say it was like three weeks Mm -hmm. and, you know, they were very kind of like, Oh, I care. I wasn't sure if I should reach out to you or not. And I'm like, Oh man, I'm so glad you did like, so glad. Right. Right. And we started and it's, it's like what I said, there is this real sense of feeling so alone of like it felt like darkness they just couldn't even imagine how their life wasn't gonna be that like that's how 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 heavy it was Mm. and after one hour the light that came into the room the possibility the hope that entered and it wasn't me sitting there convincing them of that 
Now here's, that's the thing. This is where the magic lies is that I think back in my sport days where you could sit and try and use this kind of like positive talk and this thinking like, you know, you can do this and it's going to be good. And don't worry. Like, you know, I'm not doing that. I'm sitting here holding space for this true suffering that somebody feels. I'm going to hold that. I'm going to be able to be in that space with them with that. Mm. And as they move through that reprocessing, there will be a moment where it lifts. There will be there. I've never had an experience where it hasn't. And in that moment when it does and the hope enters, that's the true magic of EMDR. That's why I'm so passionate about it. Cause I see it happen all the time. That's not just you creating a raw, raw and, yeah. uh, and hoping that it's infectious. Yeah. It's an embodied feeling. You know, mm. when people talk about a sense of embodiment for me, anyways, in my own experience of it, but also watching people, it's right. like when that happens, you fully feel that shift in your own being. And then you get to move forward in the rest of your day, just noticing that shift. Right. And so, the yeah, Tom, ask me. No, please. <laughs> I could so, talk about it forever. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well then I'll jump here. I, I'm, I'm the same. So, <laughs> but um, so when say just that example, someone had a loss or just had another period, I want to even reverse just or, or rewind just, a, a, for a moment and and say maybe one of the biggest takeaways of today is for the women listening to acknowledge and and or just know that if they're going through what they're going through that there's trauma you know and and that it's okay and that you should and can access things that can help and and it should not be belittled or or shoved into a corner because it's not um relative to other people's difficulties or I, I that is is such a huge thing um but then just in line with what you were um just talking about I had a question about after after a session like that so um I've got a lot of questions, yeah. <laughs> but if they're, you know, they go out in that day and, and they see, um, the woman or, or is this more work or just, you can jump in after it. But if they see a woman who's pregnant, right. When they walk out your door, uh, you know, or they, um, you know, get an email like in two hours after your appointment that, you know, they're invited to uh, a baby shower or whatever it might be. Um, are those triggers um, reduced in intensity or or frequency, or is 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 that a piece of of this as well? Beautiful. Okay, great question. So, I have two things I want to say in that. The first one, and, and and sort of what you just said, what really helped me with understanding how I had experienced trauma in my life, because, you know, growing up in sort of a system where there wasn't sort of space for acknowledging, you know, feelings and emotions was Gabor Mate somewhere wrote, and he said, children aren't traumatized because they're necessarily hurt children, but they're traumatized when they're alone with their hurt. Mm. That was powerful. That, huh. that line changed my life. It changed the way that I understood my own experiences in, in my childhood and in, in beyond that, and also how I showed up with my clients. So I just wanted to offer that to huh. the first thing that you just said. Right. So the second, oh, sorry. Admitting that you need, it, 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 it's such still a barrier to counseling. I, 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 to me, I use, I have for many, 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 many years, and like anyone who does not have, a performance coach and a counselor and various consultants is, is not, not loving themselves. <laughs> I like, like to think about it as like a going team. too far. I'm sorry. No, but I, I think it's like thinking about a team, right? So when we yeah. think about like the most sort of like successful operations, and this is like my sport in me, it's like, how do we bring in all of the experts in all of the things, yeah, the right? Village. If you want, yeah. yeah, the village, we need yeah. that. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, this is, you know, sort of my, my, my passion about is like, what would happen? What would it look like if you had someone like, like me sitting on your team, I was in the boardroom with you and, and was able to help with like these hard things. It doesn't have to be that I'm the only person at the table, 
Yeah. Right. You have multiple people at the table, but you get to decide who those people are. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But going back to what you said, so what EMDR does in the, in the, cause there's multiple phases. So the first phase is to desensitize the trauma memory. Okay. So if we're going to go in and, and it, the first one is going to be that we didn't get pregnant, we're desensitizing how triggering that is in our nervous system by using EMDR. Once you completely desensitize that, you bring it say from a, a 10 out of 10 to a zero out of 10. The next phase of EMDR is installing the positive cognition. This is the fun part. And this is the part I always say to clients, you got to hang in with me long enough to get to this part. Yeah. And then we get to install rather than like, I'm not good enough is I am good enough. You know, I yeah. am good enough, but those are old beliefs. Like those beliefs came from somewhere else. They're not mine, you know? And once we desensitize that there's a freedom, it's like it, un it, un it unhooks, right? the reprocessing. That's right. So the, un, the, the reprocessing unhooks it. And so then what happens is then we get to sort of clear it from the body. That's the last phase of EMDR. Now a client might go out and she might come back, you know, a week later and go, you know what, Kara, I, I'm not, I don't feel alone. I definitely see a lot more hope. I'm not getting activated as much. I don't feel as sad, but you nailed it. I saw somebody with a baby. I saw another pregnant, I saw someone push it. And that still I'm noticing it's triggering me. And I'm like, mm -hmm. great, great. Because then we can take that trigger of mm -hmm. noticing that and we can desensitize that too. Mm -hmm. And so that's the beauty of it is that eventually you will be able to drop it to a zero where, yeah, you will notice people walking around with babies, but it's not going to impact your nervous system in the same kind of way. Okay. So, okay. So when, as with most people walking the earth, there's probably trauma, whether it's, it's big T, little T, I'm not sure how it's referred to, but, but, uh, I think no one here gets out without some, uh, That's right. so they come into your, to your clinic, maybe even prophylactically, you know, or they're, they're having fertility struggles. So each month is, is traumatizing and their family's hard on them about getting pregnant, whatever it might be. That's obvious. That's, they can. They can verbalize that to you, but there could be things that are under the surface that maybe am I wrong in saying have that, that survival you said that have been desensitized to a point where they don't know or don't remember. Um, how, how do you work? How do you find that, that, and, and how do those triggers kind of show themselves or, or is it just because you said it doesn't need to be necessarily be spoken about, but it can be processed or it can be decent. Yeah. Okay. Anyway. Yeah. That's my question. Kind of. <laughs> well, so, so this is sort of my, my thought of the whole process is that if we can come into a, a, a group space and you can start helping by just, you know, doing EMDR and desensitizing the things that are happening right now. Okay. That's going to help the person continue in that process, right? And they're, it's going to help them sort of continue to be in that process in a different kind of a way. And so if every month they're coming and you're kind of like what I say is like triaging it, you know, if you can, yeah. Yeah. if you can triage it immediately, what we know is that we're, this experience is not going to become a layered experience later in life. So we're going to, oh. it's like this moment in time is not going to be an added, added trauma to the bank. You yeah. know what I mean? We're treating, now, the, we're treating the bleeding at the moment. That's right. That's yeah. right. Then what happens is, is that I'll have clients, you know, that will say, I'm, I'm doing great. I'm like, yes, good. Go into the world. Like, you know, go in and, and, and live your life in the, in this different kind of way. Right. And they do, and people will go and it'll be like sometimes six months, sometimes eight months. And then I'll get, you know, a, a client book in and, and they show up and they're like, all right, I'm ready. I'm ready yeah. to do this part. I'm noticing that this is happening in my life. This is, this keeps showing up for me. And because they're already a believer from the other stuff that they're, they've done, then they're ready to do the next part. And the truth yeah. is what you said, nobody comes out unscathed, yeah. you know, like everybody's stories are different, but there are, you know, there are stories from childhood that maybe haven't been attended to. And so right. when people are ready, they will, Dig deeper. you know, yeah. yeah. And I, I never push people to do that. I think, sure. I think what I've seen is that it's it's really important that 
you know, also in time and space, right? Like if people are going through the fertility journey and they're still working and there's all this other life kind of pressures, like that's not the time to be unpacking a whole bunch of trauma. But if we can come into the space and ensure that people aren't, you know, adding more to yeah. their, to their yeah. backpack, yeah. then that's something, right? And that's, that's often probably what you see. You know, I don't, I would say less than 10% of the people that come to our clinics are saying, I just want to get really healthy before I start to try to conceive. Yeah. That's the ideal, you know, or I want to clean up all the stuff in my, in my mental, emotional cabinets before I even think of moving forward with, with starting a family that would, you know, obviously it doesn't work that way very often. Well, and I, I think that's really beautiful because I think people have, there are people there that have that foresight. And so that's why I think it, you know, it can really be a beautiful addition because, you know, for me, when I had my twins, you know, when I talk about that seed of, of not good enough, like I never took a maternity leave with my two oldest boys and continue wow. to work and mm-hmm. be a mom and like do all the things. Cause I believed I had to. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we t- sometimes people talk about like the pressure cooker. Well, I got pregnant with those girls and I didn't know I was having twins. It happened. And I was so ill that it completely took me. I couldn't function. I I was sick all day, every day with migraine. That's actually how I came to the instill really, because I was, I was like physically dying, but the universe just said to me, sorry, you're not listening. Like you're, you haven't done this work. So we're going to, we're going to halt you in your tracks here. Hmm. And, and, and that was hard. It was really hard, but it also was a beautiful moment for me because I had no choice. Like I was confronted with having to do that work. And looking back on it now, I'm like, man, what difference that would have made for my life if I had unpacked some of that stuff first. Yes. Yes. Wow. As, as amen. Um, and, but that also too, I think even there's an education behind what could be trauma, you know, and, and mm-hmm. you, you will never figure that out if you don't kind of do the work. You know, I, this sounds silly, but I, and, and I still say, I, 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 you know, I prelude with, with that text, which tells you everything as a counselor <laughs> that I'm, I'm, I'm minimizing it. But um, <laughs> I, uh, you know, I was once asked by someone, something that triggered, uh, you know, I, I was, I was a capable child. I was good at things. I was good at sports. I was, I was pretty smart. I'm very, very, grateful that you know how how fortunate i was and and but i felt um i got bullied at a time by older kids because i was that Mm -hmm. and it caused me to dim my light for a lot of things in my life because that equaled you're not lovable if you're really great Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know and and until that sounds so ridiculous and boastful, <laughs> you know, it, it, that it still is hard for me to say, and you know, out loud, but it's, it legitimately changed everything, you know, and for me in, in a lot of ways. So people even understanding what trauma looks like, it doesn't have to mean you're in war, you know, and obviously that is unbelievable. And I have no idea, you know, um, how that is managed, you know, but, um, uh, just the every month being, you know, maybe a trauma or, you know, it, it giving yourself permission to, to, to dig in and find out is so liberating and to allow yourself to be vulnerable with someone like you to, that is trained to dig in and help put some language to some things and maybe point out a couple things that may have happened in life that may be operating in the shadows a lot more than you think, you know, um, is an unbelievable first step. You know, I, I, I think in too many people's eyes, still going to counseling means you're crazy. And, yeah. and, and it actually means that you're brilliant in my mind, <laughs> because you're just like, you'd go to the gym, you got to go and, and do the work, you know, with your mental, emotional and spiritual, um, um, well-being. And so first I just, you know, the permission to, to come to you 
and 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 to dig at least to stuff that you can find and have someone point out because there's another layer on top of that that might be transgenerational that might be birth trauma that that and and I wonder if you can touch on that if EMDR kind of can peel away layers back into transgenerational traumas like that uh, for for an example for people that that um you know uh someone with an alcoholic great grandfather that like you know things play out over time or maybe um uh people in in that are are, are Jewish may have some from 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 the past or i it it those are just simple examples but is there any can you talk, can you speak to that or the birth trauma, like how birth was difficult and how that may kind of stand in the way? Yeah. Like, well, I'm I, the I, child and I'm trying to conceive and the way I was born. That's what I, that's what I mean. Yeah. And I guess this is, this is the thing I, 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 I can't sort of quote and give, give to whoever said this or where it's from. Cause it's something that has always kind of stuck with me. And someone once said that and I don't even know if this is correct anymore with all the research, but something like we carry seven generations of trauma in our prefrontal cortex, like seven. Wow. So if you go back and you think about that and you think about, you know, even just me and sort of learning more about my ancestors and where they came from and what that looked like, right. You start to kind of go back and do that journey and you start to see, wow, like all of the traumas that they would have, you know, witnessed been a part of, or, you yeah. know, whatever. And so you know, that's a whole nother conversation. And cause I, I, but, but here's the thing is that the, the, the people who have, and, and, and maybe I'll just use myself as an example, like mm -hmm. you believe or are taught that, you know, when you get pregnant, it's supposed to look and feel this way. And then when it doesn't, you're like, well, what's wrong with me that this doesn't feel good or that I'm not happy or that this isn't the best moment of my life. And then yeah. you go into you know, give birth. And I always, I thank my clients because the wisdom that I got when I went into the birthing room was I had so many women come to me and be traumatized by the fact that their birth didn't go the way that they wanted it to. Right. And right. I that, always that thought plan, oh, that wild. Plan like the plan, the plan didn't work. And yeah. then they blame themselves for it. Yeah. And so when I was having my kids, I hired a doula and I said, listen, I have, I'm not going in with a plan. Now I was a very type A person. So anyone that knew me was like, huh, you're not going with a plan. But I saw enough women like beat themselves up about the fact that it didn't go according to the way they wanted to. I was like, I don't want, I'm not going to put that pressure on myself. Like I'm, and yeah. thank God I didn't because there was so many things that happened out of my control when I had my kids, but mm. But then after, it's like how you're supposed to feel, how you're supposed to bounce back, how your birth is supposed to be. It's supposed to be this real glorious, like beautiful thing. And then when it's not, you're like, well, I did something wrong. Or, and, and, you know, some of the negative cognitions that go with birth traumas are like, I'm not smart enough. I didn't research enough. I didn't prepare myself enough. I didn't. And you just think to yourself, man, this is a traumatic experience on its own. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. birthing yeah. a child is a, is, is a mini trauma on its Even own. Even if it goes well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Even if it goes well. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. crazy. You know what I mean? Like it's a crazy process of it's like. sheer magnitude. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But then you have all this noise. And so, you know, I think the aftermath for a lot of, a lot of people is that then that connection with the child. So if it was a traumatic birth. And you have basically, you know, been through, you know, certain things. And then they hand that baby to you and you're supposed to like, you know, feel a certain way and you don't like, man, there's so much trauma in that. And then we think about what we know about attachment, right? Mm -hmm. So that minute that that baby comes out and then there's this, you know, skin to skin and all the things that we want to do. And it's, and that's beautiful. And it can be hard for people to feel connected when right. something's been traumatic and they and they're alone in that like i just said earlier like when you feel alone in your experience of something that immediate connection that you want to have with your child it might not happen and what happens is that you know i'll have women come to me 5 years later now think about 5 years of growing a child and feeling that disconnection and feeling right. that shame feeling that feeling the anger that layering you layering the little yeah. t's on that big t exactly it, you you just layer it and so then 
you add stress onto that, you, you add, you know, may, maybe marital conflict onto that. Like there's so many things that can get layered onto that. Yeah. And I just think to myself, like, man, and then, and then, you know, I think that, that parents and, and you know, my, my experience of like mothering is it's like the Olympics for women truly, right, because right. as soon as that child comes into the world, you, you don't have a chance to do all of the other things that you need to do necessarily. Like your life depends on keeping this, this human alive. Right. Yeah. So yeah. every day is like day after day after day of like going through this, like marathon of like doing it. And so that's why I always kind of think, you know, when I hear people talk about like, Oh, well, we need to create space for self-care and we need to make sure we have time for ourselves and do this. Like I was the person that used to hear that and roll my eyes. I'd be like self-care who has time for that. Like it <laughs> you could not get me to sit down and do that kind of stuff. Right. And I was listening to a podcast recently. And when I walked away from it, I thought the difference of the me now compared to me before is that the me before I, I was so stuck in my own looping of my negative beliefs on how I had to show up in the world, that the self-care stuff and all the things that would have been good for me, they would have never entered my zone. It would have just never happened. But because I was, I was, you know, in my situation kind of forced, my twins kind of forced me into that. Hmm. I then got to, I got to, you know, clean some of those negative cognitions out of my system so mm -hmm. then I got to see how, you know, other people's needs were more important than mine. And when I got to sit in that and reprocess, you know what you, you talked about, like this idea of having to like feeling small, right? If we believe that we are, can't take up space, that we're not going to be like, you know, encouraged to be in that space, well, we're not going to do it, right? right. We're, especially if we're young, you're not going to see adults doing that if they weren't encouraged to do that as, as young people, yeah. And so the reprocessing though, it's like cleaning out the, cleaning out the, the, the closet. Right. Yeah. And once you clean it out, then you go, actually, I am worthy of that time. And actually I can say no to this thing. Cause I'm actually okay to disappoint people now. You know, my mm -hmm. body doesn't respond in the same kind of way. So I am able to stand in a space where like, I, I can see my needs. I can advocate for my needs. I can ask for help. And I can do these things because the, the fundamental trauma seed has, has been cleaned out. Huh. So like I said at the start, so um, loss, miscarriage, perinatal loss. Um, what did I do wrong? You know, uh, that's a trauma. I, of course, it's a trauma. It's a loss, any loss. Um, uh, termination is, is, um, is another big one I see, you know, any woman who's struggling to get pregnant and has terminated a, a pregnancy in the past, that is yeah. a big deal. Yeah. Uh, and, and I'm not equipped to deal with that, but I am happy to hear that something is, um, um, I, I have a, you know, my beliefs in, in how the spirit works and that that isn't, you know, something they did right, right or wrong. Mm -hmm. Um, but, it, but, and I share those to try and, but I am so glad that you have, you know, this EMDR is, uh, is, is applicable to that. Cause that is, is a big deal, uh, too. And, and a major, what you'd probably call a roadblock to fertility, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. almost being like, I, um, I don't deserve it or something maybe because I did something wrong. Yeah. I mean, the, the list of negative cognitions that attach to certain experiences or events in our life are wild. And I, I couldn't even, it would, we could probably do an hour where I just list all of them, you know, yeah. they're I, every client that comes, they teach me a new one. Yeah. And you just think, Whoa, haven't heard that one before, but yeah, let's work with that. Right. Like, let's get yeah. that out of, yeah. like, let's get that out of your body. And so I think that's the thing too, is the interesting part of it is like, when we're talking about the body getting pregnant and we're talking about how our body holds the trauma, it's mm -hmm. like what I, you know, like I, I'm curious about what would happen if, you know, we, we were able to right. clean out those things and move it from the body. Right. Like what difference would that make? I don't know. Like, I don't, I don't know the research on yeah. it, but 
I do feel I, pretty confident it would, it would, it, it would like. I, I see it applicable after a failed IVF or, or frozen embryo transfer, you know, where there's obviously that's a difficult time. And most often couples are wanting to kind of get momentum back sooner than later and, and, and try again um, every month after the cycle. Um, but I, but something else too, that we haven't really touched on. I'm not sure if you work with, but is, is men, their, uh, mm-hmm. their, their instinct to provide, mm-hmm. protect it, you know, when, when something uh, as challenging as, you know, a problem with their sperm or, or just fertility comes up, um, or miscarriage or, you know, it's obviously a trauma for the woman. Um, but for sure, the man doesn't address it himself. This is a whole another podcast you and I could talk about. But, um, you know, my experience of of men in this space, I mean, first of all, you know, our 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 boys are really socialized to to push down any kind of emotion, right? It is like so it's sort of entrenched in like the masculine sort of culture, I think. And changing a bit. Have, yeah, yes, but you're right. right like yeah. from the beginning, from the beginning. And I have two boys. So I see how this plays out even when they were like three and four years old in different spaces. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, so then fast forward to a time where you're with someone that you really care about and you love, and you're trying to start a family and you feel like you can't do that. Well, number one, you know, we don't lots of times even I mean, there's there's a handful that have have been brave enough to come, you know, with their partners and be curious to do it. But it's like we got to even just start with what is what are the what what's coming up for them? Right? Yeah. Like, how do we even identify that and, and name it? But the other thing is that there as much as you know, there's there's spaces sometimes for for women to connect with their friends for men. I don't, I feel, I still really feel like that space is really lacking, you know, like, and for men to be able to talk about their experiences of that with other people in a way that is really authentic and that also doesn't involve substances is (laughs) really, really interesting. So that's That's a whole other conversation. It's psychedelics maybe. (laughs) Right. It's a whole other conversation, but I think, I think what happens is, you know, I, I had this, this young client that was like, Oh, it, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm really just concerned about my partner. You know, I think I'm, I'm okay. And then I was like, mm, let's just, let's just tap with it. You know, just get curious about it. Right. And, and, and sure enough, like, that's the thing. Nobody become no one's unscathed. No. Yeah. Right. And so what happens is for, for that other part is that it takes them back to a moment in their life where, you know, they should have done something more or, you know, whatever that negative cognition. was. So now you've got two people dancing with their own stuff, trying to do this thing together that they've never done before. And it's hard, you know, it's hard. And so each needs to be strong on their own. So, so my message to men in a, in a sense is if you don't acknowledge what's going on with you, you won't have the support that you truly want to give to your partner, the power to support and, and so, and, and men don't, like you said, don't have the circles of friends that rally and even women after time with fertility, stop leaning on yeah. that anyway, you know, they, but there are groups and things maybe more so online and, and stuff like that, maybe meetups and, and such, but um, still lacking in that territory too, in loss. I mean, people that women that go through miscarriages don't mingle in the infertility groups because they don't feel like they belong there. Right. Um, you know, they're more in a, a trauma and loss group or if, but they don't go there either, but, um, um, men even more. So, you know, it, it's actually being really brave and doing your job. Well, I believe if you, uh, put your heart out on the table and be vulnerable enough to go to someone like Kara and, and talk with them, um, because you'll be better equipped to, be strong yourself and support your your partner through through what you guys are going through it's un, unbelievably important and and you know you can only be as a father i'm i can only be as happy as my least happy family member so if i'm pretending i'm okay and other people in my family aren't i'm just pretending 
Yeah. And you know what I would say on that is that the most beautiful thing, I think you know, there tends to always be one person in a relationship that really just wants to like get into action and like, let's do, okay, let's do the next thing. And like, okay, that's, you know, this didn't work. Well, let's figure this one out. Yeah. But I think the most beautiful thing that any human can offer another human in these moments of like suffering or a really hard moment is a witness is to be uh -huh. a witness to what is present in the room. Okay. You are not required to say the right thing, do exactly. the right thing, know what to do next, but to hold space for another human in a way that they feel like they're being seen and held. It has so much power. It does. That is a great message. And might I, I even me listening to that, as you say it, I'm like, yeah, guys, you know, like just, listen, you don't have to fix, but I want to flip that on its head too. And, and because I think, um, I think a lot of, uh, and this, I might be stereotyping, I apologize, but I'm trying, you know, we're just trying to classify by nature more than judge, but um, women often will want, and we're, we're talking cisgendered heterosexual, you know, um, couples um, to not be not inclusive, but it, um <clears throat> will kind of want their partner to express themselves in the way they think is right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and, and through like deep communication and, 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 and men are often different and maybe a little bit more silent, but want acknowledgement and don't want anyone to see them necessarily cry or whatever, but know, mm -hmm. know that that all those emotions are there and holding the space might look a little different. Is that accurate? Or, or yeah, and I, I think what you just said, though, is like, you know, for men, there's a story about needing to fix it, right? Mm. There's a story about having to be the one that solves the problem or, mm. or whatever that might be. And so I think, you know, I'm, I, I feel strongly that each, each person really has to find their own footing, right? And, and when we can, when we're brave enough to kind of peel back the layers and understand what are the things that prevent us from showing up in spaces where we can share how we feel or, you know, preventing us from being vulnerable or preventing us from real true intimacy. Like that really is in my right. mind, the greatest type of connection in a relationship is like a, a sense of intimacy where two people can just show themselves exactly who they are, like as they are. Yeah. And in order to do that, we have to understand the thing that blocks us from doing it. What yeah. gets in the way from that? And that's the that's the layers, right? Th those are the stories that we've carried with us from the time we were young. Yeah. And so, you know, I guess I would just say is like, you know, we can only show up as our best self in any moment, given what we know. And I think that's the gift of EMDR. You know, Maya Angelou's quote is like, when we know better, we do better. And mm -hmm. I think that my experience of seeing how EMDR allows people to have or a deeper sense of awareness about the why, you yeah. know, does it change overnight? It doesn't. But when we, it's like, um, I'm really connected with animals and nature. And so like the eagle, you'll see the eagle on my website. And that's because the eagle is the, you know, flies the highest in the sky. He has this perspective that it's so um, expansive, you know, we can see mm -hmm. all the parts of it. Yeah. And I think that's what EMDR allows us to do is that every single time we come in and we can reprocess a deeply rooted thing, it allows us to kind of take another step up where we can look down and see something a little bit different. There's a bit yeah. more in the room and then we, it, we do that more and we do that more. So now we're on the peak of the mountain and we're looking down and we're like, yeah, I can see all this stuff and it's there. Like, this is the thing, like EMDR doesn't erase your memory. But what yeah, it does do memory. is it desensitizes how that memory lives. And so it becomes a part of our story. You know, right. it doesn't go away. It's, it doesn't, you know, so we'll remember that we had those miscarriages. We'll remember how alone we felt. We'll remember how hard that was. But the beauty of that then is that we can then at some point in our life, and I know this is true for me, is to be able to sit and meet people with a different kind of empathy and compassion for that suffering. Cause man, I've been through it too. You know, it didn't look the same as you, but like, yeah, yeah. it's hard. Right. So you take, it's, it's kind of taking the power back from, from, 
your trauma and yeah. and and instead of it living in the shadows and making I, I I forget who coined it, but I love beach ball as as a as a uh, metaphor. You know, you can you hold it underwater, but but if it ever gets away on you, it usually splashes and smacks you in the face. <laughs> you, <laughs> yeah. Your your trauma and 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 how it makes you make decisions from the shadows in your day to day life yes. is yeah. real. You know, and yeah. and the moment you just shine light on it and that might be youngy and stuff and you know is 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 the day you take the power back from it and and this is so great that emdr plays such a big role there because you you got to do to me and in, in, in my experience and what i've seen doing the work yourself is important and then finding what's going on with you and then bringing it into a room maybe with you and your partner with someone like you that is can can help you pull from what we know about you and and then apply it to this is what's coming up when you're interacting with someone in kind of a real world uh, testing testing mm-hmm. field like in the in the field mm-hmm. with your wife or with your partner um to see how okay I've done the work but is it are you recognizing it in real time so Absolutely. that's where couples therapy Without the individual therapy, I, I I don't know. Now I'm giving my opinions that I think they're both important. Well, yeah. And, you know, there's there are some clinicians that, you know, in the U.S. that I met recently that are actually doing EMDR with couples, you know. So there's a witnessing of that experience for each other. And, man, it, it sounds like amazing. Oh, it's great. You know, so it's, yeah. yeah, it's, it's you know, there, there are people out there that are doing it. I I, yeah. I just think it's, yeah, it could be really powerful. There's just something to be said for going through the process with the person you're supposed to be yeah. intimate with. And, and you know, what's more intimate than, you know, exposing your weaknesses and putting your heart out, you know, in front of them to to take care of, you know, uh, in, in, in the real world. That's, that's beautiful. I love it. So, okay. So this... This is something you do groups of, and who knows, we'll maybe talk logistics and and stuff like that. But is there, this is huge and this is great. And I think the bottom line, you know, anyone listening can probably pick out, you know, something that they would love to jump in on and and try this with. So how how do people access the EMDR if they're not in Vancouver, if they are in Vancouver? um, And... uh, um, yeah, just, I guess that will put things in the show notes too, for people to, to find you in particular, but yeah, well, um, my website is karekalen.com and, uh, but you know, to, to find practitioners around the world is, um, you go to emdria, E-M-D-R-I-A.org and you can find a therapist on there and find someone in your, you know, in your city or your town, wherever you live. And, um, yeah. So it's a good starting place. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I'll get any resources you think that uh, are good for people out there and throw them in show notes and stuff too, just on if anyone wants to dig in a little bit more on information or maybe a a video of what it kind of maybe looks like, just because people are curious. I don't ever recommend that for acupuncture, but um, Mm -hmm. I... uh, uh, we'll, we'll put those in the show notes. So, so, and, and so people can access you and, and more information. Perfect. Awesome. Thank you so much, Kara, for coming on the show. Is there anything else that you wanted to to leave people with? I mean, we've been, we've dug deep. This is an hour and I want to let you get back to life and, and, but I appreciate your time. Um, was there any closing words or any? Well, I think I, I would, I would just hand it to you that I want to thank you for the opportunity to share this with, you know, with a wider audience and, um, you know, I sent out my my group offering into the world, and I always, you know, was loved to see that uh, that you were interested in learning more about it. And I just think that that says a lot about who you are, and and uh, that you were curious to to bring me here. So I just want to thank you for for this opportunity and for recognizing the importance of it, because it's people like you that allow this work to, to come into different spaces. So I'm, I'm truly honored and grateful to you. Oh, well, I, that, that's very sweet. I, you know, I truly want to, because I come from this holistic field and have worked so intimately with, with 
IVF and midwives and, 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 and from A to Z reproductive health. And I, you know, I guess it's maybe my generation uh, or my part of my responsibility is to try and learn what over the last 20 years, what does help people that I'm seeing. I clearly, I, I don't have all the answers, you know, I may have some, you know, and I may be able to facilitate some people's healing, but for certainly not everybody's. And, and it takes that village that you, you spoke to, or that virtual board of directors that is uh part of your team uh, in your, in your healing. And, and there's, um, so many wonderful, talented, skillful uh, practitioners and 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 styles to to heal and and treat various um, you know problems with the the mind and body. It, it's it's just my mission to find you know solutions and and if it wasn't before you know which it it was, but it certainly is now and after. Uh, COVID, the the mental emotional side of any health condition is is been um, really highlighted, and 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 so that that's a positive thing because I you can't treat anything without working through the mind, whether it's a broken limb or it it it, it doesn't matter. You know that from sports, mm-hmm. um, or whether it's terminal cancer diagnosis or or infertility or or anything and everything in between um there needs to be uh and and the village these days is more the professional versus the the really wise aunt or great grandma in the village you know is 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 counselors like yourself and and healers that are truly out there to to try and help address um the whole person because ivf mm-hmm. can get you pregnant yeah. but there's there's a whole lot more to to that picture that that should be um, um, looked at and addressed and nurtured and supported and and loved and and uh, and paid attention to. Absolutely. 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 Well, until part two, thanks yeah. for, for coming on the show and we'll talk to you again um, soon, Kara. Thank you.